My name is Charles, and I serve as one of the pastors of Rama Baptist Church. We're glad that you've taken a few moments to watch one of our services. Each week, the body of Christ here at Rama gathers around the Word as we draw near to God through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we have access in the Spirit to the Father. We pray as you watch this service today that you too would find yourself centered around the Word of God and the Gospel of Jesus Christ. We do, however, want to encourage that you not allow watching these services online to become a substitute for you regularly gathering with the body of Christ. We believe that God has designed us as believers to live our lives in communion with one another through the gathering of the church, for Scripture reminds us of the importance of gathering with the people of God. Again, thank you for taking a few moments to watch one of our services. We pray that it serves you well. Good morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What a joy it is to gather as his people here this morning and worship the living God. As we begin our time of worship this morning, I want to invite you, if you're able, to stand with me as I read from God's Word in Psalm 95, and we'll respond in song, giving him praise. Psalm 95, 1 through 6. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. In his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Let us sing together praise to him. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise him, for he is thy help and salvation. Oh, he who hear, now to his temple draw near. Praise him in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord who o'er all things so wondrous the reigneth. Shelters thee under his wings, yea, so gently sustaineth. Hast thou not seen how thy desires there have been? Granted in what he ordained. Praise to the Lord who with marvelous wisdom hath made thee. Deck thee with help and with loving hand guided and stayed thee. How often grief hath he not brought thee relief, spreading his wings for to shade thee. Praise to the Lord who doth prosper thy work and defend thee. Surely is goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. Ponder on what the Almighty can do if with his love he be friend thee. Praise to the Lord, O then all that is in me, adore him. All that hath life 
given breath, come now with praises before Him. Let the Amen sound from His people again. Gladly forever adore Him. Amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and almighty God, we come before you in humble adoration. Our hearts filled, lifted in gratitude for the gift of your presence in our lives. As we have read the words of Psalm 95 and sung this hymn of praise, we are reminded of your majesty and the boundless love that sustains us each day. We offer you praise not only for the beauty of creation, but for the depth of your mercy and the strength of your grace. You are the rock of our salvation, the source of our joy, and the refuge of our souls. May our worship be a pleasing aroma to you, our voices harmonizing in unity, and our hearts resounding with thanksgiving for your unwavering love in our lives. In your holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. For the last few weeks, we've been emphasizing and reminding ourselves that when we gather for worship, we're gathered in conversation with God. Worship is a dialogue. God speaks and we speak, and then God speaks and we speak. It's a conversation just like you have with one another, except this conversation is made possible through Christ. We're able to commune with the one true and living God. So let's think for just a moment. God has spoken through His Word, and we've sung his praises in praise to the Lord, the Almighty, and we've spoken to him in prayer. So as the conversation goes, whose turn is it to speak? God's. See, it's just like Sunday school. It's a trick question. Nobody wants to answer back. Everybody's scared. So God speaks to us once again through his word, 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us all from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Let's pray once again to our Lord. Father in heaven, we've heard you speak once again through your word. And we've been reminded of the great truth that through Christ we have fellowship with you. And not just with you, but with one another. All of our divisions, all the things that would separate us according to the ways of this world have been set apart because of what you've done for us in Christ. We praise you for the fellowship we have with one another, but ultimately the fellowship we have with you through Christ. But Lord, so often each and every week we don't walk in fellowship with you. We say that we're in the light, but often we revert back to the darkness. We go back to our dark sinful ways. Lord, we need your cleansing. Lord, if any of us were to be so bold as to say, no, this doesn't apply to us, we have no sin, then your word reminds us that we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But Lord, this is the kind goodness you've shown to us that you've promised if we confess our sins, you're faithful, you're just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we know that this cleansing is perfect and pure. You've given it to us through your son, Jesus Christ. When you save us, we are perfectly forever saved. Lord, we want to be in fellowship with you. So for all the ways that we've stepped out of that fellowship this week, would you remind us and cleanse us as we confess our sins, knowing that you are faithful and just to cleanse us, not just once, but forever, until we dwell with you in perfection for all of eternity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Charlotte Elliott was uh, a lady who lived about 200 years ago, and she struggled like many of you. She struggled with knowing whether or not her sins were forgiven. 
But a pastor encouraged her to come to Christ, not with her good works, not with her good deeds, but simply to come to Christ, trusting Him alone. And she penned this familiar hymn, Just As I Am. And we're used to that. We think of that as being a hymn of invitation to come to Christ for the first time. Well, that's certainly true. It it fits that purpose very well. But we must come to Christ in the same way time and time again, not with our good works, not with our good deeds, but coming to Christ alone for forgiveness and cleansing. So even as you remain seated, would you lift your voice in this familiar hymn, Just As I Am? Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou didst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I continue in that conversation with the Lord that Pastor Charles just mentioned, we turn our attention to his word in First Timothy as we see a beautiful picture of the gospel and the truth that our godliness flows from the gospel, not of ourselves. 
In 1 Timothy 3, 14 through 16, God speaking through Paul says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Would you stand with me if you're able as we sing the gospel together? This is a new song to us, our first Sunday to sing it. The choir has sung it a couple times previously, and on Wednesday nights over the past month, we've been learning this hymn as well. So if you've been here on Wednesday nights, sing loud for the rest of us. And for the rest of you, feel free to ease your way into it, singing as much as you're comfortable. Come behold the wondrous mystery. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. Ye the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. Come behold the wondrous mystery, He the perfect Son of Man. In His living, in His suffering, never trace nor stain of sin. See the true and better Adam come to save the hell of man. Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the law in him we stand. Come behold the wondrous mystery. Christ Lord upon the tree, in the stead of ruling sinners, hangs the Lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption, see the Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to glory. Grace unmeasured, love untold. Come behold the wondrous mystery, slain by death, the God of life. But no grave could e'er restrain him. Praise the Lord, he is alive. But a foretaste of deliverance, how unwavering our hope. Christ in power resurrected, as we will be when he comes. Amen. You may be seated. Did you notice as we sang about the glorious mystery of the gospel, and right before that as Pastor Laramie read from 1 Timothy chapter 3, that Paul gave that great declaration of the mystery of the gospel, he gave it in light of instructions to the church. Did you hear what Paul said to Timothy? He said, I hope to come to you soon, but should I be delayed, I'm writing to you that you might know how 
to conduct yourselves in the household of God. That first letter to Timothy is written for that purpose. It's written to the church to understand how the church is to be organized, to be thought through. And so there's a very close connection between the gospel and how we live that out in the life of the local church. This month, we're going to be taking uh, time to think about that, the biblical foundations of the local church. So I invite you this morning as we uh, begin this examination to turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. You'll want to keep your Bibles open because, unfortunately, that's just one of many texts that I have today. Uh, you know that my uh, preference, and I believe the most biblical option for preaching, is to go through books of the Bible. But it is good and right every now and then to pause and think through uh, a subject, think through a doctrine, and think through it expositionally, still going to God's Word, still seeing what God has to say, not putting my thoughts upon the text, but pulling together all these different places in the New Testament and how it speaks uh, to this idea of the church. This morning, specifically, the church and its members. So we'll begin in just a moment in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. I want you to consider this question. Maybe you've never thought about it before. Is the local church, is membership in the local church optional in the Christian life? Is it optional? Is it just one of those nice tools that we have in our belt? The same way, say, you know, reading Christian books outside of the Bible, just reading a book by a Christian author, that's good for some people. Some people prefer not to read. Is church membership that way? Is it just an optional extra in the Christian life? Some people feel that way, that the local church, it's nice, it's just not for everybody. And you understand why uh, we would come to that conclusion that a lot of people feel that way. When you look at just our Southern Baptist Convention, two-thirds of the membership, when you hear people talk about those big numbers, those 14 million Southern Baptists, two-thirds of them cannot be found. The FBI cannot find them. They don't actually go to church. That's true in our own local church. If you look at our membership directory, you look at the beginning and you see pictures and then the uh, addresses and information of all of our active members as well as our homebound members, those that we know would be here if they could be here. If you add that up, you get roughly ar around 100 people. But then you take into consideration that long list of names at the back. That's about 200 more people who some are at other churches, some are falling away from the Lord. They're not in church at all, but they're certainly not here so that two-thirds uh, analysis, that works out perfectly right here at Rama. We have about two-thirds of people who would think they were members and they don't actually attend at Rama. And so that leads lots of people to think the local church, it must be optional. It must be outdated. I mean, after all, think about all the people who have been hurt by the local church. Many of you have seen this in others. Perhaps you've experienced it yourself. There's legitimate harm that has been done by people calling themselves Christians in a church and they've hurt one another. Perhaps your story is similar to a lady named Patty. Patty grew up in a church of about 50 people, and her church was much closer to a cult than what a church should be. You see, the pastor there was a dictator. He only allowed his church members to read his books. He wouldn't allow them or, or recommend for them to read anybody else's books. You were only considered a member in good standing if you showed up for all five services of the week. I don't even want to begin to know what all five of those were, but you had to show up for all of them. He distorted the gospel. The gospel was not taught at the church Patty grew up in. You see, the shepherd abused the flock. And in time, this so-called shepherd not only spiritually abused the congregation, but he began to make sexual advances on Patty. And she endured this harm, this evil from a so-called pastor for over a decade. And so you understand why people like Patty might give up on the local church. Well, we'll return to her story in a little bit. But for now, I ask you again, is church membership optional in the Christian life? Well, we turn our attention for now to Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And if you're able, would you stand for the reading of God's Word? Our brother Luke writes in Acts 2, beginning in verse 42, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day... 
attending the temple together and breaking bread in their houses, uh, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word. We're thankful, as we've seen over these last few weeks, that your word is sure, it is certain, it is trustworthy, and it's even sufficient for how we live together as brothers and sisters in Christ, not just in the universal church, the idea that one day we will gather with all the redeemed in eternity, but even now in this life in the local church. Your word is enough. So we pray that you would enlighten our minds this morning according to your word and increase our love for your local church. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. When we think about the birth of the church, most of us go in our minds automatically to Acts chapter 2. You probably are familiar with the story. It's the day of Pentecost. Jesus has ascended into heaven. And before he ascended, he promised his disciples that the Spirit would come that the Holy Spirit would come and indwell all believers and lead them into truth, that He would be with them even to the ends of the age. And so you come to the day of Pentecost, 120 believers are gathered, and the Holy Spirit descends in a remarkable way. You've read the passage before. You remember the tongues of fire appearing above their heads, and people begin speaking in known languages that they had never studied before, all for the purpose of the proclamation of the gospel. You see, thousands of people were gathered in Jerusalem for one of their high holy feasts, and they hear about what's going on, and like a good Baptist preacher, Peter begins to preach. He goes through the text, and he starts explaining how Jesus had promised these things. He looks at the Old Testament, and he says, the, these people are not drunk, as you suppose. The Holy Spirit has come, and he goes through. People begin asking, what shall we do? And he says, repent and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And you notice there, keep your Bibles open. At the beginning, uh, right before this passage, verse 41, it says, So those who received his words were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Most people consider that the birth of the church. And when we think about the early church, we just assume those guys were perfect. They had it all figured out, they didn't have any problems. We say, if we could just get back to the early church, everything would be fine. Well, this is where staying with a book of the Bible and reading through a book of the Bible really helps correct our thinking. Because when you keep reading the book of Acts, do you remember what happens? Peter and John, they get thrown in jail. That's not what you want normally in the life of your church. Uh, you have people lying to the leadership. Ananias and Sapphira lie and they die because of their lies to the local church. And then there's division in the church uh, that seems to be because of ethnic partiality. You see that in Acts chapter 6. And there's so much division that the church has to come to uh, a business meeting and say, hey, we're going to appoint deacons to restore harmony there in the local church. So the early church is not perfect by a long stretch. That's just, you know, to chapter 6. You could keep going. They were not without their problems. But yet we see this snapshot here and other places in the Bible give us pictures of what the church should look like when it's functioning well. And this is a wonderful picture here. We begin this morning just getting an idea what should the church look like when it's functioning as it should. And if you look at verse 42, uh, you're going to see the impact of this gospel upon the church. As Peter preached and as people are being saved, they're marked by four priorities. They are persistently devoted to four things. Look at verse 42. They devoted themselves to, number one, the apostles' teaching, number two, the fellowship, number three, to the breaking of bread, and four, the prayers. They're persistently devoted to these things. First of all, the apostles' teaching. Can you imagine what a blessing that would have been in that day? They're hearing the apostles, not just by reading their words, but they're, they're their pastors. The apostles are the pastors there. They haven't written any of these New Testament books that we now have. We've talked about we have the more sure word. But in their day, the apostles are their pastors. And they're preaching to them the Old Testament as Jesus taught them to preach it. So you remember on that Resurrection Sunday in Luke 24, as Jesus is going on the road to Emmaus and then later that night in the upper room, he begins explaining to them how all of the scriptures point to him. And so the apostles have learned how to proclaim Christ in the scriptures, and they're devoted to that. We won't think longer on that, but the apostles' teaching, but also to the fellowship. They're devoted to the fellowship. Now, you might think, wow, 3,000 people got saved. That is going to be one big potluck. 
All right? Now, you understand that fellowship is a wonderful expression. Uh, a potluck is a wonderful expression of our fellowship, but that's not the only way our fellowship works. They've been brought together into one new body, a new organism, the local church, and they have this fellowship. They are, uh, they're not 3,000 Lone Ranger Christians just going around doing whatever they want. They've been brought together into accountability with one another into the local church there, and they're persistently devoted to the fellowship. But also, the third thing is the breaking of bread. Now, you probably already know that's a reference to the Lord's Supper, one of the gifts that the Lord has given to His church to proclaim His death, burial, His resurrection, and His soon coming return. What a joy that even today as we consider the local church, we get to gather at the Lord's table, breaking bread, looking forward to His return. But the fourth thing that they were characterized by, their fourth priority there as the local church there in Jerusalem was prayer. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. We haven't the time to go through all the places in the book of Acts where you see the church gathered in prayer time and time again. They were persistently devoted to these things because the gospel had made an impact. The gospel had saved them and brought them into fellowship as the local church. But did you notice in verse 43, the impact of the gospel is also felt by the watching world. All came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. You see, the impact of the gospel is felt even by the people there in Jerusalem who haven't yet trusted Christ. All of Jerusalem knows what's happening, happening, what's taking place here. They've been in Jerusalem. They remember just a few months earlier when these people cried out, crucify, crucify. Jesus was a slain. He was crucified outside of the city. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. And then uh, his followers begin announcing he's risen. And then they say, oh, he's ascended into heaven. And they've noticed the change in these people. And now they've seen what happened there on the day of Pentecost. And all of these things are happening and they're filled with fear. The words literally fear. They're filled with awe, with fear, because of the signs and wonders done through the apostles. Through. That means God is doing them through the apostles. And why are these uh, signs and wonders done? They're for the purpose of validating their ministry. They look at these apostles and they say, wow, they're doing the same things that Jesus did. They must have actually been commissioned, actually been authorized by Jesus to do these things. And so the question always comes up, should we be looking for signs and wonders like this today? I would say the answer is no, because once again, we have God's sure, certain word. We don't need any further authorization than that. We're not looking for signs and wonders. We're looking for the gospel to work among us and to work in the world just as it did here in Jerusalem. Well, the impact of the gospel is felt not just by the church, but by the watching world around them. But then Luke does something interesting. He kind of circles back. He gives you the same ideas, but he gives you more information about it. So looking at verses 44 down through the beginning of verse 47, he tells you more about the impact of the gospel upon the church. He says in verse 44, all who believed were together and had all things in common. All, um, all who believed were together. There's a, a wonderful picture of fellowship that is fleshed out in this idea of being together. You understand, some of you are thinking about membership. You've asked questions about what does it mean to be a part of Rama. Part of it means actually being together. If you skate in 15 minutes late and you skate out before the last amen is done, it's hard for us to believe you actually want to be with us, that you actually want to spend time with us. Now, understand, we're not being dictators and controlling of your schedule. We're not saying you must be here every time the doors are open, every opportunity throughout the week. But for us to be the church, we actually have to be together. We have to know one another. We have to affirm that I know who this person is. I know that they're a believer. They're part of us. You see that here in the early church. They were together, and they had all things in common. Well, there it is. This is what people have been looking for for 2,000 years. Socialism right there in the Bible. No, you know better than that. That's not what going, is going on here. Socialism, we understand, is a deadly doctrine of demons. It's forced upon unwilling participants by the government. But this is sincere. It's done out of love and concern for one another. This ought to be the question that marks us just as it marked them. What can I do for my brother and sister in Christ? How can I be generous 
towards one another. You understand they willingly sold private property, but they didn't give up their rights to private property as socialism would demand. They still owned homes. They met in homes. So they're doing this not by force, but out of generous hearts. They have all things in common. And you get an example there in verse 45. We've referenced one of these examples already. It says they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Well, you keep reading in Acts and you see a good example. You see Barnabas. Barnabas sells his land. He brings the proceeds to the church and it's a blessing to the church. But then, beginning of chapter 5, you have that story of Ananias and Sapphira. And they were, were told in the text they weren't forced to sell their land. They didn't have to give their money to the church. But when they voluntarily did that, they lied about it. They came to Peter and they said, we sold the land for such and such amount. Here's the whole amount. And God struck them dead. Do you think God doesn't care about money? Not in some prosperity gospel manipulative way, but it's clear that from the text, they were lying not just to Peter, but to the Holy Spirit. God cares even when we receive the morning offering. Keep that in mind. All right, so you see these folks, they lied not just to Peter, but the Holy Spirit, and this is a serious offense. They had all things in common. They willingly sold to meet the needs of others, but this was done both well and done negatively there in the church. But look at verse uh, 46. It says, day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, as verse 47 begins. They were committed to gathering together. Now, it says they go to the temple, and you might think, wait a minute, that sounds like something old covenant that they would do. But when you keep reading again in the book of Acts, you see that they gathered in Solomon's portico, a very large open area there on the temple mount, a place big enough for receiving 3,000 plus Christians gathering in one worship service all at the same time. They were committed to gathering together to worship the Lord, gathering, praising God. Day by day, they attend the temple together. They worship publicly, but they also worship privately. They're breaking bread in their homes. They're receiving their food with glad and generous hearts. They praise the Lord Almighty just as we have done. So you get more information there about the impact of the gospel upon the local church. But then Luke concludes verse 47 by once again saying the gospel is having an impact upon the watching world. It says they're having favor with all the people. They're gaining the respect of the watching world, but notice here's the main thing. The Lord added to their number that day and day by day those who were being saved. I've already pointed out to you in verse 41, the Lord added to their number. Here, verse 47, the bookend, the Lord added to their number day by day. There's a couple of things you don't need to miss about that. If they're adding to their number, what are they being added into? They're being added into a local church. Salvation, baptism brings you in to the local church. They're not just random standalone Christians there in Jerusalem. They're brought together into this body. But above all, the main thing you need to recognize, who's the one providing the growth? Who's the one saving them? The Lord. The Lord added to their number. The same way that today the Lord is the one who does the saving, not us. The Lord added to their number day by day, and they were being saved. So when we think about this, we get this snapshot of the early church, and we see uh, the Lord working mightily through that. But you understand, even from the beginning here, there's clearly insiders and outsiders. There's people who are in, they're being added to the number, and there are those who are still on the outside. They may be watching, they may be looking favorably, but they're not actually part of the local church. So I want us, with that in mind, to start asking a few questions about the church. How do we determine who's an insider? And who's an outsider? If Acts chapter 2 is the birth of the church, then Matthew chapter 16 is the birth announcement. I want you to turn in your Bibles there to Matthew 16. It won't be on the screen. You need to keep your Bibles open and turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. We need to hear from the lips of our Lord how to determine who's in and who's out. Matthew 16, starting in verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, 
Others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Verse 20, then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now, this passage raises all sorts of questions, most of which we don't have time to answer this morning. But just know that starting next month, we're going to begin working our way through the Gospel of Matthew. I'm really looking forward to it because uh, we know every sermon text as we go to the Scriptures, Christ uh, should be the focus. We should seek to understand everything in God's Word through the lens, through the, the, the view of Christ in the Scriptures. But when we come to the Gospel of Matthew, he's front and center on every page, and I'm looking forward to it. But for now, we, we ask a few questions of this text. You look at verse 18, and I want you to notice what Jesus said. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. That's the first time that we get the use of this word church in the New Testament. It's coming from the lips of Christ himself. And what does Jesus say about it? He says, I will build my church. He is Lord of the church. It is His. He owns it. He possesses it. And He gets to set the rules. Jesus is building His church. He promised that He would do that. We don't need to put that pressure on ourselves that we are the ones to build. We labor, we work, but God is the one who gives the growth. We're not responsible for building. Christ has promised that He will build His church. And so because this is His, He defines what the church is. He is the one who uh, builds the church, then Jesus is the one who gets to define who belongs in the church. These are his rules, not mine. Jesus is building his church. He sets his rules. And so he asks Peter, who do you say that I am? It's great to know what other people think about me, Peter, but to be a part of the church, it matters what you say about Jesus. Peter says, you are the Christ. You're the Messiah. Well, that's wonderful, Peter. Jews have been looking for the Messiah for centuries. They've been looking for the one who would come and set them free from their bondage, the one who would put Israel back in its right place. And many people have come and they've claimed to be Messiah. So Peter, do you really understand who you're talking to? Do you really understand who Jesus is? Peter continues, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter understands that Jesus is God. He's not just a moral philosopher. He's not just a good teacher. He's not just a leader of a religious movement. Jesus is God. Now, does Peter understand everything in that moment? No. We we follow the story of Peter. We kind of chuckle at Peter sometimes because he reminds us of ourselves. Sometimes Peter says things that he wishes he could take back. But Peter understands this is who Jesus is. He is not ready to uh, write a systematic theology. He's not ready to teach in seminary. But Peter understands who Jesus is. He's making the true confession about Jesus Christ. Friend, are you making the right confession about Christ this morning? Do you understand that Jesus is the Christ? He's the Son of the living God? Are these more than just words to you? Because after all, we are in the state of Georgia. Most people could say these words back to us. But are these more than just words to you? Is Jesus your very salvation, the only balm for your sin-sick soul? Do you know Jesus in this saving way? Some of you have attended church, you've thought about membership, and you've wondered, what does it take to be a member of any faithful local church? But certainly, what does it take to be a member at Rhema? The first step is understanding who Jesus is. Do you know Him as your Savior? When we look at the life of Peter, we get lots of insight into the glorious truth of salvation. Earlier in uh, the gospel journey, when you look at the gospel of Luke in chapter 5, Peter sees Jesus do something remarkable. And Peter says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. When Peter saw Jesus in all of his glory and his holiness, Peter says, I'm not that. You must get away from me because I'm a sinner. You see, the church is the only organization where you must admit how bad you are to be admitted in. Peter recognizes that. He knows that he's a sinner. 
you must do that as well. And then we see another a snapshot of salvation with Peter. Jesus is walking on the water, and Jesus calls Peter from the boat, come walk on the water to me. And Peter does a good job until he takes his eyes off of Jesus. And then he begins sinking. And Peter offers the shortest, sweetest prayer in the Bible. It says, Lord, save me. That's how simple it is to cry out to Christ saying, Lord, save me, recognizing that he can save you. You can't save yourself. He's the only one to turn to. I encourage you, if you don't know Jesus as Savior, cry out to him today. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Outsiders become insiders by trusting Christ alone. Peter understood that. And here in Matthew 16, he makes this clear confession of Christ. And what does Jesus say? He says, upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, is Jesus building the church upon Peter because Peter just said the right words? Did, did Peter just become the first pope? You know the answer to that. It's no, of course not. I believe that Jesus is teaching us here that the church is made up of true confessors. Those who have rightly understood, they have truly, savingly confessed Jesus Christ as Lord. You can't separate Peter from his confession of Christ. We know that the church is not the building. We understand that. But it's the people, but it's not just any people. It's specifically the people who have looked to Christ and Christ alone for salvation. The church is composed of true confessors who have made the true confession. So what does that mean for us? We've thought about this before. We've talked through it. If somebody just walks in and says, hey, I love Jesus. I want to join this church. Do we just immediately say, well, praise the Lord, you're in? No, that's not what we do. They may be the kindest person in the world. They may seem sincere, but we're going to follow the example of our Lord who pressed for clarity. Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? And we must say to people, which Jesus are you talking about? Is it the Jesus of Jehovah's Witnesses? Is it Jesus of the Mormon cult? Is it the Jesus of the Roman Catholic so-called church? Is it the Jesus of the liberal Protestant church? Because none of these Jesuses are actually the true biblical Jesus, and yet every one of those people that I've just alluded to would say, I know Jesus. I love Jesus. We press for clarity and we ask, who are you talking about? Is it the Jesus of the Bible? We say, well, pastor, isn't it enough that they just say they love the Bible? No, because people can love the Bible and twist the Bible and distort the Bible. We've seen that in our study of 2 Timothy on Tuesday nights. We must be faithful to the gospel. We must preserve God's word. So the clear answer that we must give to ourselves and to anyone who seeks to join us, this is who Jesus is. We must study the scriptures and wrestle with who our Lord is. Well, that's a question about how we determine who's an insider, who's an outsider. I know some of you are with me so far, but you're thinking, Pastor, do we really have the authority to do that? That seems like we're overstepping a little bit when we say that we as a church, not just the pastors, we as a church must affirm someone into membership and also dismiss people from membership. How do we have the authority to do that? Well, the answer is Jesus. Jesus is the one who gives us this authority. Look at verse 19, Matthew 16, verse 19. Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. My goodness, binding and loosing in the kingdom of heaven. There's all sorts of things to work out from this passage. So I'm going to give you the short answer today. My understanding of what this text means, I'm quoting from a man named Jonathan Lehman. He says, Jesus gives Peter the authority to do what Jesus has just done with him to act as God's official representative on earth for affirming true gospel confessions and confessors. Think about that. What has Jesus just done? He's pressed Peter for clarity, and Jesus has adjudicated between heaven and earth. We know Jesus is from heaven, but he's standing on earth at that moment, and he's speaking with the authority of heaven, saying, you, Peter, have made the right confession. You have got it right. So when Jesus, let's see, when I continue this quote from Lehman, the interactions between heaven and earth in this passage are amazing to consider. Peter rightly confessed who Jesus was, and Jesus said that Peter's right answer came from the Father in heaven. Though Jesus was on earth, he spoke on behalf of heaven. Then in the very next breath, he authorized Peter to do the same thing, to represent what's bound and loosed in heaven 
by binding and loosing on earth, end quote. So when Jesus announces that he is building his church, he says, not us, Jesus says his church must be filled with people who make the right confession about Jesus. He's talking about binding and loosing, and it has something to do with his authority to evaluate who's in and who's out, who is part of the church and who's standing on the outside looking in. There's another place where Jesus uses the same language, the language of the church, the language of binding and loosing. Turn just a page or two over in your Bible to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 15. Some of you automatically recognize this passage as one we go to when we speak about church discipline. And what's remarkable is when you look at all the places in the New Testament when it speaks of church discipline, those are some of the greatest proofs of the need for the local church. Because you can't do discipline on the universal church. It only works in the local church. Listen to what our Lord says here in Matthew 18, starting in verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it in a slight whisper out in the parking lot. No, let's try that again. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the deacons. No, and all the deacons said, praise the Lord. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. There again, Jesus is using that same language. He speaks of the church. He speaks of binding and loosing. We don't have time to look at everything related to discipline. We'll do that at a later time. But for now, I want you to see that Jesus, again, is evaluating who is in and who is out. He's saying these are people who've made the right confession about who Jesus is, but they've continued sinning. And I have good news for you. We all continue to do that. So Jesus isn't demanding sinless perfection. But when we've made the right confession of Christ, when we've been saved by Christ, and then when we're confronted with our sin, we understand the mercy and grace of Christ. We come to Christ again and again, just as we are without one plea, pleading for the cleansing of Christ. Not that we get it right every single day for even half a moment of a day. We keep sinning. But when Christ, we sin less as time goes on. We should as we're growing in Christ-likeness. But we don't become perfect. And when we're confronted with our sin, now we know how to deal with it because we've seen what Christ has done. And so here in discipline, Jesus is saying you go to someone and you're showing them their sin and they refuse. They're saying... I don't need the grace and mercy of Christ anymore. I don't need Jesus' cleansing. I don't need his forgiveness. So here's someone who has walked in the gospel. They said, I really have made the right confession, but now it no longer appears that way. And so Jesus is telling us how to deal with situations like that. Again, we'll think on that more at a later date. But for now, you need to see Jesus is giving us this language of binding and loosing. He's talking about the language of the church And it only works in the midst of a local church. Well, some of you are thinking, yeah, pastor, I've I've heard about the local church, but isn't it true that all Christians will be together in what's called the universal church? Well, yes, that's true. When we look at the end, we look for all of eternity, all the saints of all the ages from every tribe, nation, and tongue are gathered around the throne of Jesus. But for now, in this life, there is no meeting of the universal church. You can't go to any Colosseum and fit all of the universal church in there. If you get an invitation to go to the first service of the universal church, please let me know, because I don't think it's possible here on this earth. We can only live out the truth. There's a truth of the universal church. but We must live it out in a local church. We must commit to be a part of the local church. And I want to demonstrate that to you with, uh, with the time we have left with three metaphors and a list. I know you're excited about that. Three metaphors and a list. As we think about the different images that Jesus gives us related to the church here in the New Testament, there are three, there are many more, but three metaphors that really paint the picture for how we as Christians are to live. We've made the right confession of Christ. He's saved us. He's added us to the number of a local church. And we ask ourselves, 
how are we supposed to live? How is this supposed to flesh itself out? Well, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 give us an image. If you want to turn there, I can read it for you. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. We get the image of a spiritual house, image of a temple. 1 Peter 2, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we have the image here, a metaphor of a spiritual house, the image of a temple. And you may know, it's true, Paul says in 1 Corinthians that we as individuals are the temple, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Paul also says in 1 Corinthians that the church as a whole is the temple of God. Here, Peter's using that same language, and he's emphasizing that we're being built up together. We're being built up into something that we cannot be on our own. Chuck, if you have a pallet of bricks and you want to make it into something, is it the finished product when it's still sitting on the pallet? No, it's just a pile of bricks. Christ has taken us, and he's building us up as living stones into a fitting spiritual house, the temple of Christ. Now you ask yourself, when does this building up take place? Is it during the week? No, it's when we gather together. The Lord is building us up together when we gather together. This only works in the local church. You can't do this with the universal church. You can't do this with your friends and brothers and sisters from other churches. You can encourage one another. You can edify one another. But Christ has promised to build us up as a temple, as a spiritual house, and it only works when we come together as the local church. I want to tell you something that I think may be surprising to some of you. I think the most important thing in your Christian life is not how often you read the Bible and pray. That's critically important. Just as you eat food every day to survive, you need to pray and read your Bible daily to commune with Christ. But think about how many Christians weren't able to read God's Word through the centuries until it was given to them through a printing press and all the technologies. We talked about Tyndale. But from day one, Acts chapter 2, what were they doing? They were gathering together as the local church. The most essential part of your Christian life is gathering with the saints. That we're being built up together. Not built up into our own preferences, built up into getting the things we want, but built up into what Christ would have us to be as one body of Christ one local church. Well, that's the image of the spiritual house, the temple. A second image that Christ gives us to help us understand the church is the body. 1 Corinthians 12, and we turn there often. You're familiar with it. But we turn there once again, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Starting in verse 12, Jesus says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. We jump down to verse 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And it keeps going on and on and on with this, what's a comical image of the body rebelling. A body part saying, no, I don't need you. No, I, I don't really need you. Hand, um, I can get along without the foot. Any of you who've ever even come close to an amputation understand it's not that easy. God has given us the body for everything that we need. And this image here of the church as being the body of Christ, we need one another. The Bible is screaming from beginning to end that in Christ, we need one another. And it only works through the local church. Yes, we benefit from the ministries of other Christians. I have books in my office that are written by all sorts of other Christians, but they don't gather here at Raymond Baptist Church. We need one another in the local church. We have friends from other churches. We fellowship with people from other churches. But Christ is building us up as the local church. You see here in this passage that it uses the word member, which must imply membership, all right? So that's not something that pastors came up with in order to have some nice record-keeping system to keep up with members. God uses the language of membership. 
And it's not the same as what we think of with Sam's membership or Costco membership or membership at a golf club or a gun range. The local church is not a club where those who make the greatest financial investments have the greatest say. The church is not a social gathering for those who have a common interest in religion. The church is not a service provider where members come in and get their needs met and leave the other services for someone else. The church is not Burger King where the customer is always right and you can have it your way. Paul uses this image of the body, members of the body, and he's referring to one local church. Mark Dever has told the story many times about being uh, in college and going to church. He and a friend started attending the same church at the same time. Mark quickly joined the church, but that friend, he would come, but he would only come in time for the sermon. He didn't come early enough for the rest of the service. And so one day Mark asked his friend, why don't you come for the whole service? And some of you may sympathize with his answer. The friend was just straightforward and said, I don't really get anything out of the rest of the service. And Mark came back with an interesting question. He said, have you ever thought about joining the church? And the friend was incredulous. He said, join the church? Why would I do this? You see this man, he was in seminary. He was doing evangelism as part of his job every day. Why would he want to join the local church? He said, if I joined the church, they would only slow me down. Maybe that's the sentiment of your heart, that the church would just slow you down. Well, Mark replied to his friend, he said, did you ever think that if you link arms with those people, yes, they may slow you down, but you may help to speed them up. Have you ever thought that you might be a part of God's plan for them and for you? See, this only strengthens the idea that we need one another. Some of you are on the fringes and you're thinking, I like Rhema, I like showing up, but I don't really want to officially commit because that, that might ask too much of me. Have you ever thought you may be what the Lord wants to use to grow us together? Well, you have that image of the body. One final image that the Lord uses that we will discuss this morning is the family. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, Pastor Laramie already read it for us earlier. The family, the church is the household of God, the family of God. Now, perhaps we, we understand that image, that metaphor, maybe better than anything else because we often think of one another as family. You've been with each other, many of you, through decades, and you know the love and affection you have for one another, the need you have for one another as family. Have you ever considered the difference between family and a neighbor? You can have good neighbors and they not be family. They can be almost like family, but it's not quite the same. Many of you are neighbors of the church. You come, you visit, but you're not family. Remember, the first step into the family is through Christ. He's the one that brings us together through God, through adoption into Christ. There's a wonderful image of the family. You see, when we're family, we seek the well-being of one another. We tough it out through hard times. We don't run away just because we don't like the way things are going. We love one another as the family. In fact, one other thing that I must put forward to you this morning to, to demonstrate the fact that the New Testament is full of the expectation that Christians be part of a local church is that language that I just used of one another. Have you ever noticed? It's just two little words, one another. And yet they're all throughout the New Testament. We're to love one another. We're to care for one another. We're to live in peace with one another. We're to live in harmony with one another. We're to watch over one another, hold one another accountable. We're to edify one another. We're to bear with one another and to pray for one another. We're to be examples to one another. On and on and on the New Testament goes with this one another language. But you understand that only works in the local church. Yes, I have other Christian friends that I pray for and that I love dearly. But I can't pray for all the Christians of the universal church. I can't pray for every believer in China, in Bolivia, in India, but I can pray for my local church. I can't love and serve and care for believers all around the world, but I can love and serve and care for the local church. This is the beauty of the local church. Listen, I understand this is a lot of passages of Scripture to throw at you. The goal was not to give you a disorganized sermon, but to show you the overwhelming testimony of God's Word is that the Christian life is meant to be lived in fellowship. That membership in a local church is not optional. This really does matter. You see, this is Christ's plan for the church, the church that he died for, the church that he redeemed with his own blood. But some of you, I understand that this is a sensitive subject. Some of you have been hurt by the church. 
Some of you may have gone through things, maybe not as bad as Patty as we referenced at the beginning of the sermon, but you've been through difficult situations in church, perhaps at other churches, maybe even here, and you've stuck it out through the years, but you've been hurt by the church. When we fail as a church, as we certainly will, does that mean that God's plan for the church has failed? Is there some other option apart from the church? No. I want you to hear the words of Patty's own testimony. She said, while it's true that I suffered terribly in that cult-like church and at the hand of its abusive pastor, it's also true that I thrived as a member of a healthy church and under the care of biblical leadership. I've experienced emotional and spiritual healing through the church's faithful preaching, teaching, and counseling, through friendships forged in the church. I've been built up, rebuked, challenged, edified, and transformed to look more like Jesus. The church is where I've been encouraged in my gifts of teaching and counseling and where I found opportunity to use them in service to others. And as a childless woman, it's in the church that Christ has given me more spiritual children than I could ever have had biologically. I would have missed out on all of these gifts if, in disobedience, I rejected every church because of my experience in an abusive one. Christ is the head of the church, and He has given the church and its leadership as gifts to all believers, including me, she writes. Knowing these truths frees me to love my church, to joyfully submit to its leadership, and to flourish under its care. I must not allow my painful story to inform me about Christ or His church. Instead, my painful story has to be informed by Christ's good character, by His purposes or His church. The things I suffered in that cult-like church were not good, but when seen in the light of these glorious truths, I can watch with eyes of faith as God works them all together for my good. End quote. This is just one testimony of the goodness of the local church. Any of you have experienced this in your own life. If we took time, you could testify to how the Lord has been faithful and ministered to you through the local church. So what do you do with all of this? For those of you who have been a part of this church for decades, I pray that this is an encouragement to your soul. I know that you would testify to many benefits of the church, but maybe this strengthens and helps you remember why the local church matters. For others of you on the fringes of membership, maybe this helps you understand where we're coming from as we begin this series of thinking through the local church. For some of you, you begin to understand now that the door to the church is through Christ. You need to throw yourself upon the mercy of Christ today. Let's go to Him in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank You for Your good gift of the local church. No other organization can bring the unity, can bring together people from the variety of backgrounds and differences because all of those are set aside at the foot of the cross. You have united us together into one body through Your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we look forward to the day when we will worship you for all of eternity and we will worship you with the saints of all the ages, every tribe, nation, and tongue. But for now, Lord, we thank you for the privilege that you've given us to be a part of one local church. Would you strengthen us and build us and make us healthier through your word? For your glory we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as we respond singing the church's one foundation? The church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From them he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. He led from every nation, yet one of the earth, her charter of salvation. 
nation, one Lord, one faith, one birth, one holy name, she blesses, partakes, one holy food, and to one hope she presses, with every grace in dune. Though we the scornful wonder, men see her sorrow pressed by schisms rent asunder, by heresies distressed. Yet saints their watch are keeping, their cry cries up how long. And soon the night of weeping shall be the morn of song. The church shall never perish, her dear Lord to defend, to guide, sustain, and cherish, is with her to the end. Though there be those that hate her, and false sons in her pale, Against the foe or traitor, she ever shall prevail. Mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war, she waits the consummation of peace forevermore. Till with a vision glorious, her longing eyes are blessed, and the great church victorious shall be the church at rest. Yet she on earth hath union with God the three in one, and mystic sweet communion with those whose rest is one. O oh, happy ones and holy, Lord, give us grace that we, like them, the meek and lowly, on high may dwell with Thee. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward as we collect our offering this morning. Brother Mike, would you pray for us?
I tend to invite our ushers, I mean not our ushers, but our deacons, rather, to come forward and help us as we observe the Lord's Supper. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Supper that we are about to celebrate is a symbol of our union and fellowship with our Savior, risen and ascended on high. It is a remembrance of his shed blood and broken body on our behalf. And it is an expression of our union and fellowship also with one another as Christ's body. Ultimately, it foreshadows that great marriage supper of the Lamb when we will sit around his table in heaven and commune with him forever. Rhema Baptist Church welcomes all Christians who have received believer's baptism and believe the same gospel preached here today, who are living in fellowship with Christ and with his church to participate in the Lord's Supper. In a moment, you will be served the bread and the cup. Please do not eat and drink right away, but hold on to the bread and to the cup and wait until we all eat together and drink together. Brothers and sisters in Christ, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. All who have been adorned as his bride, come then joyful to the joyful feast of our Lord. Let us pray. Father, we are indeed thankful for the communion you have offered us in Christ. You have invited us to gather and to sit around this table. We rejoice in the symbol that this is of our fellowship with you and our fellowship with one another as the body of Christ. Lord, let it be edifying to our souls now as we participate in this supper. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear now the words of institution of the Lord's Supper as we find in the Holy Scriptures. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. And Jesus took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And he gave it to his disciples.
Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus said, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, all of you drink of it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now to him who loves us, and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Great is the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Hallelujah. Amen. Deacons, you may return to your seats with your families. And as the disciples did with Jesus on the night that they partook of the Lord's Supper together, they sang a hymn. I'd invite you to stand with me if you're able as we sing together, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred minds is lying to that above. Before our Father's throne, we pour our hard and prayers, our fears, our hopes, our aims are one, our comforts and our cares. We share our mutual woes, our mutual burdens share, and often for each other flows the sympathizing team. When we are called to part, it gives us inward pain, but we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. You may be seated. As we prepare to go out into this week, we uh, go with opportunities to serve the Lord. And so if you look to the screens, we'll have a few announcements for this upcoming week. Um, I trust most of you figured out that you got an extra hour of sleep last night. Uh, you didn't realize that, number one, that would make the sermon longer, and that, number two, it would change the days of the week, all right? So uh, Wednesday night, we're, we're not gathering, but Thursday night, this week only, we're going to have prayer meeting at 6, choir rehearsal for 7. Uh, we appreciate your patience as that works out with some scheduling difficulties. So this Thursday night, we will do our Wednesday night activities, all right? Then Friday morning, we will go to the Apple Orchard. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard, we have rented uh, a van, a 15-passenger van, if we need to rent another one or carpool, whatever we need to do. But we're going to get everybody there comfortably and safely. So be sure to sign up out there in the foyer. Many of you have. And uh, be sure to do that this morning because after today, we've got to make our final plans about making sure everybody gets there. All right? Uh, so we'll leave the parking lot here at 9 o'clock Friday morning. We'll head to... Uh, the 
Southern Charm restaurant where we eat there in Blue Ridge, and then we'll go to the Mercier Apple Orchard as we've done many years past. And so we'll have many uh, a great time with that, but please be sure to sign up for that. All right, and the donations for our Thanksgiving food bags, those are due next Sunday. So please bring those. I know many of you have already participated in that. You know that we have our monthly food bag ministry in December and November especially. We like to try to give a little extra just in case uh, the folks who receive those bags, that may be uh, a big chunk of their Thanksgiving. And so we want to bless them as we have been blessed by the Lord. So you see a list there in the foyer of many different uh, food options that you can add uh, and bring, uh, or you can donate and specify on the memo line there what it's for. So be uh, sure to do that if you're able. All of that's due by next Sunday, November 12th. All right, and then November 19th, that's the Sunday before Thanksgiving. We're going to have a special time of worship in the chapel. So Sunday school is the same. You'll go to your Sunday school class just like normal, but we're going to have our worship service 11 o'clock in the chapel. And so that'll be a wonderful time. We trust you'll make your plans to join us that Lord's Day as well. All right, and then Sunday night, uh, November 26th, that's the Sunday after Thanksgiving, we're going to have a movie night, but it's not just any movie. Uh, it's a film, a documentary called The Essential Church, and it documents uh, the issues when church and state collide. We've had opportunity to think about that, not only through the text of Scripture uh, throughout recent years, but also through the current events of history. And we, this documentary, The Essential Church, uh, covers the story of three different pastors uh, in modern times of dealing with the overreach of the, of the state, but it also uh, takes you a little journey through church history to show you uh, how Christians historically have dealt uh, with this interaction between church and state. Uh, I promise you, you will enjoy it, and if nothing else, hang around for the desserts and the discussion afterwards, all right? So Sunday, uh, November 26th, the Sunday after Thanksgiving, make your plans to join us here at Rama for that. That got it? All right, let me look through here, make sure I'm not forgetting anything. That looks really good. All right. So we have already sung a hymn, but we're going to go out with the blessing of the Lord's Word. Hear this benediction from Romans chapter 15, verses 5 and 6. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go in peace.